this evening, I'm going to do kind of a tutorial and review in one. Um, the tutorial is I'm going to show you guys how I use alcohol markers with watercolors to achieve um, vibrance and depth that wouldn't be possible with each media on their own. And the review portion is I'm reviewing Canson's art board with the Montval watercolor paper finish. So um, a while back, I inked this with a Sailor Mitsuo Ida brush pin. They are alcohol marker proof and waterproof. And I also taped the edges. Um, and it's not necessary to tape the edges. I just wanted there to be a white border. So I was kind of masking it off. And I've already gone ahead and selected my colors so I can get started. I really like using alcohol markers on watercolor paper. Um, it tends to be sturdy, it tends to be thirsty, and it allows for um, a lot of color layering and a lot of blending. Um, watercolor paper does not have a surface on it. I mean, it has a surface on it and it has a tooth on it, but it doesn't have a like a coating on the surface the way other many other papers do. So, um, some papers like vellum, you can only do so many so many layers of alcohol marker before it starts to remove the prior layers. That's not the issue with watercolor paper. The only problem is it'll kind of drain your markers. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're trying to make your markers last longer, then um, you should probably use less thirsty papers than watercolor paper. But if you want to do this technique that I have where you use watercolors and Copic markers together, then you're going to need that thirstier paper. And you guys can see my E00 marker is running a little bit low. And when that happens, you start to get smudging, like right here. This is particularly noticeable in light areas like the skin. So I'm going to take a quick break and refill my E00 or check and make sure I have a refill for it. So I'll be right back. All right, I refilled that marker. <laughs> like, like that's some great accomplishment. Like, yeah, I did it. Y'all should be proud of me. Another, um, so if you are having problems with your alcohol marker smearing, like what happened over here, another common issue besides your markers dry and it's pulling the ink, is that you just didn't let your ink sit long enough. I like to let my inks cure for at least 24 hours. Um, this particular piece, uh, life's gotten in the way. I've been kind of busy. So it's actually been drying for a few weeks now. At the very least, you should wait at, like one hour. Uh, I would always go longer than that if possible. For me, that means I have to, if I'm gonna do a review or a test, it means I have to prepare at least a day in advance. Now, most people will use like small circular scrubbing motions to fill in skin. Um, I use so many layers that it's not really an issue. Even though it's kind of streaky right now, it's going to be saturated by the time I'm finished. So um, I've got that first layer down. Now I can go in and start marking in where my shadows are gonna be. And as you can see, the second layer is way less streaky. By the time we get to the third layer, there's not going to be any streaks at all. Uh, and it's not going to be of this color. I mean, third layer, just in general. So I'm going to um, fast forward through this and I'll talk to you guys again when I'm adding the blush on her cheeks. So uh, I goofed and I already filled in the blush talking to the camera as though it were running and it wasn't running. That's what happens when you start recording at like 11 o'clock at night. Um, and I used three tones for blush. I used Dick Blix Shell 094. I used Copics E93 and I used Copics, I think it's R02. 
to apply blush to the cheeks, under the nose, under the lip or the lip itself, um, under the neck, and on the arms. Basically where skin meets skin. And if you're interested in seeing how I apply blush, uh, I have other videos that demonstrated. I apologize. Right now I'm using E51 to add shadow and contour to her face. And I'm really not all that concerned about heavy areas of blush application. Um, because by the time I'm done, it's going to seem more natural than it does right now. Just because I'm going to have all these other layers of alcohol ink on top of it, which will have pushed the pink towards the back. And the nice thing about thirsty papers, like watercolor paper or heavier cardstocks, is that your one marker will go a long way because you can apply multiple layers and the paper will absorb it and it'll give like um, a more saturated effect, which is useful for applying shadows if you don't have a lot of color. Right now it's looking very saturated. Um, so I think I'm going to pull back in general and try and have a lighter hand. Continuing to add shadows, this time I'm using E51. And so far the Canton Montval artboard, um, it's handling the marker pretty well. Markers, uh, the marker blends and it soaks into the paper. So it basically handles like Montval, except, you know, a heavier mounted onto a board, which is what it is. When I first found out about this paper, I thought I might be able to use it for at kind commissions since the stock is so much heavier than what I use, but it's a little bit prohibitive in this price in the price department for the types of commissions I do. Now, if you lose some of the color you put down and you want to kind of regain it, and I'm just blending out right there, um, you just simply go back over it with that color to reintroduce it. So under the arm might be a good place for me to reintroduce some of that pink since it got pushed back earlier. don't have to do as many um, layers of shading as I choose to do. I find that BB's blue violets make for really good uh, skin shading. Right now I'm just kind of like knocking in some shade on her eye. And if that looks intense, just use a colorless blender to sort of blend it and knock it back some. So I'm going to add shadow to her skin with BV000 and BV31. And I'm gonna do that in time-lapse and hopefully I'll remember to restart my video properly next time. All right, so I've applied as much shadow as I'm going to apply with the blue violet, and that's more for cast shadow. So her bangs would cast a shadow, her face would cast a shadow, her arm overlapping would cast a shadow. And if that seems kind of dark, you don't have to go that dark. It kind of seems dark to me too. Um, I haven't used Montval as a marker paper in a long time. I actually use like fluid more often just because it's what I have available or like pieces of biggie that were cut for like marker tests. Oh, 
what the blue violet does is it desaturates the area. So um, it just looks more like a lack of light sort of shadow. I mean, that's I know that's what all shadows are, but I mean, there's a difference between a shadow because light isn't hitting the source and a shadow because it's far away from the light source. Oh yeah, I use this for freckles too. And honestly, for this kind of a tutorial, I really should have left the skin um, unshaded because I can go in and do it with watercolor and it'll look a lot less muddy. And that's kind of the whole point of the tutorial is to show you guys that I wasn't thinking. I like to do freckles with a few different colors. I use uh, E34, E13, and E23. I try to put a variety of dot sizes and um, I also try to vary my shape a bit. I also try to have a few fairly dark freckles here and there just because it seems more realistic. My own freckles are, well, they're light now because it's winter, but in general, they're kind of dark. And if you're portraying somebody who has freckles and um, it's winter and they're the sort of person who would be inside, their freckles are going to fade a bit. Whereas in the summer, they're going to get more freckles because they're out in the sun more. And I know her eyes look a little bit Man, a little bit manic right now because uh, their her pupils are in the middle of her eyes and there's no reflection at all. But I thought I would um, like seriously manic now that I look at the video. Um, I thought I would try something a little bit different with how I I handle the eyes. I thought I would apply my highlights after the fact. I just hope she doesn't look too crazy. So another thing to take into consideration on thirsty papers like this is that um, your marker will bleed a lot. So especially if you're trying to go as lineless as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in her hair and uh, then I'll get caught up with you guys again. filled in and I'm going to color the little orange beads that are on her hair and I go ahead and go over the brown that's already on there because I want it to be influenced by the orange that I'm putting on top and also because it's a little darker than I would have liked and I'm gonna let that dry because I want um, to get an intense difference. If I put this color on now, even though it's a dark orange, it's going to blend in so much that you won't be able to see it at all. So I'm going to hold off on that. And I guess I'm going to start filling in her dress, which is going to take a while. So I'm going to do a time lapse, time lapse of that. All right. So I'm working with four colors, B24, FB2, B29 and B69, and they grow progressively darker. Uh, the darkest is actually like a nice ultramarine. It's stratospheric blue. 
this one right here. So we're going from here to there. Okay, so I've got the dress rendered. Now, non-staining colors, you can very easily push unwanted color away with um, a colorless blender marker. Now, blues, reds, certain greens, those are staining colors, and you'll probably never be able to get it to leave entirely, but you can still push some of the color back so it's not so intense. And um, the more colors you layer on, the less noticeable it's going to be anyway. So it's not the end of the world. You just maybe need to use a darker color than you'd or originally planned for. So I'm going to quickly color in her mouth. Now, um, if you guys want me in the future to go step by step over everything I do and explain all the colors and all any minor technique I might be doing, please let me know. Um, I'm assuming that since I have quite a few marker uh, time lapses and marker tutorial videos in my playlists um, on my channel, uh, I figure those of you who normally watch, you can follow along with those. You kind of have an idea of what I'm doing, but, um, if you would still, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you just find it, you know, soothing or enjoyable. Maybe you like to watch these movies, movies, these videos before you go to sleep. Um, and it kind of gives you like an asthma sort of feeling, ASMR feeling, uh, the tinglys, hearing somebody carefully explain all their tools. That's cool. I, that's fine with me. Just let me know that that's what you want because I want this to be a community. I want us to work together on this. <laughs> so, um, if that is something you're interested in, please let me know. Don't leave me hanging. So I can finally go back and add that darker orange on her hair beads. And I'm going to add, um, it's B00, oh, B000, uh, which is G. Pale porcelain blue. Uh, I'm going to add that on the rickrack, the trim on her dress, since the trim is white, so it'll imply a shadow. And then I'm going to go over it with oranges to um, for the thread. I think that'll be a nice pop of contrasting color. And I'm not worried at this point, and I won't be worried until, um, or I won't, uh, shoot. So I haven't applied any like opaque white or even uh, color pencil white onto this. And the reason for that is I'm going to do that after I watercolor because that can form a resist and um, I don't necessarily want that. Now, after I finish painting, I will go with a wax crayon and do a cute little fun design in the background so that when I watercolor over it, it's like magic. It resists the watercolor and the white underneath the wax will excuse me, the white underneath the wax will shine through. Um, and that's a very simple technique. Uh, I recommend it though, if you're looking for, you know, something very easy to do 
that has kind of like a big effect. I mean, once you learn the basics of alcohol markers or um, watercolors, you know, it's all about making them work for you. And I'm all about the, the sort of the wow factor when it comes to techniques. So I really look forward to playing around with those brush -o, uh dies I have, because those definitely seem geared toward wow factor. And uh, I'm coloring her doll with, I think it's a little more synthetic looking. It's a YR61 yellowish skin pink. And it looks a little synthetic in my opinion next to Kara's skin. And I'm doing that because I thought that would work well for the doll. So you have a little girl holding her doll. And I wanted it to look like fabric. And I think that works pretty well for that. So I'm going to go in and start filling in the threads on her dress. And um, if you feel uncomfortable leaving me a comment for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. Um, you can always email me. I'm pretty sure my email is list listed in the information about me uh, portion of my YouTube profile. And um, your reason doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I will respond to your email. Just, just be cordial, be polite. Um, that's all I really ask. Don't email me just so, you know, I don't know, you can give me an earful. But I know some people are not 100% comfortable with leaving YouTube comments. Before I started this channel, I was actually not comfortable leaving comments either. I've gotten a lot more, a lot less hesitant about that because I felt like uh, I, I just seen how some conversations on YouTube devolved quickly and I wanted to avoid that myself. It seems like for the most part in the art community, um, knock on glass, <laughs> knock on a hard shiny surface, uh, that isn't really an issue. So I'm no longer that worried about it. But if you are a private person and you don't want to leave a public comment, just, you know, just know that um, my inbox is open and that I will respond. And I respect your desire for privacy. So if there's like a question you wanted to ask me, um, but you were worried that other people might get on you, um, you know, email might be the way to go. So in some of my watercolor videos, I know I've mentioned how important it is to maintain contrast and I'm trying to do that, um, when I do marker pieces too. I do have a tendency to over render. Um, I love color. I love layering color. I love seeing how colors affect each other, but that can make a piece look overworked. So, so I'm trying to show some discretion, especially because I know I'm going to be going in with watercolor tomorrow and showing you guys how to add contrasting colors in such a way that it, it won't look muddy. Um, how to add depth of translucent color. I mean, for those of you who have um, sort of limited Copic or alcohol marker collections, this is a perfect technique for you because really you, you don't need a huge palette uh, so long as you plan appropriately and have access to watercolors. And they don't, honestly, they don't even have to be great watercolors. They can be pretty mediocre watercolors. Um, on my other blog, natosoup.blogspot.com, I have a... Um, I've been doing an affordable art supply review series and I kind of petered out um, when my Surface Pro died, but I'm going to start picking it up again soon. Um, and the whole point of that is to review art supplies from stores like Walmart and Target and to let you guys know as a professional, which ones are worth your money and which ones are worth holding out on. And I've already reviewed several watercolors on there, so. 
if you're looking for an affordable suggestion, Dollar Rowney, Dollar Rowney, uh, Simply Watercolors are okay. And I think I paid like $20 for 12 colors at Walmart, which isn't bad at all. Those of you who are interested in watercolor, you need to, um, and want to do it on a professional level, you're going to need to make peace with the fact that you might be paying, um, like seven is usually a good price, uh, seven to $10, but for tubes, but your tubes will last for a really long time. And I actually use my tubes to refill my pan watercolors for the most part. There's a couple of colors that um, I've tried doing it that way and I find that it works best if I refill it from, if I purchase the another pan because the color is closer to what I'd grown accustomed to. So this is done for tonight, other than using a wax crayon. And uh, this is a clear wax crayon. You can tell by the Harlequin body on it um, to draw some cute designs in the background. Which unfortunately you guys won't be able to see tonight unless the light catches the wax and reflects a little bit but you'll definitely be able to see it tomorrow when I apply water on top of it. And even I have to be kind of careful. Now, um, these sort of translucent wax crayons are, they're pretty commonly available. Um, you should be able to get them at like Michael's or a craft store. Um, many hobby shops will have them as well. If I so desired, I could put a layer of this wax crayon on top of Kara, effectively masking her from the watercolor and then just do like an all over effect. But I have no desire to do that because I'm not quite done with her yet and I need to be able to put watercolor on top of her. So that won't work. Anyway, I'll see you guys tomorrow with the watercolor. Have a good day, guys. So last night I started this uh, Copic marker and watercolor tutorial and I already did all of the Copic work that I'm going to do. So now it's time to move on to the watercolor. Um, now as a recap, the reason you wanna use watercolor with your Copic is um, when you're applying your shadow colors, instead of desaturating and pushing your inks to the back, they're going to sit on top translucently. So you're gonna get greater depth of color than you would have if you were just um, applying marker on top of, of areas of color. And I've already saturated the colors I'm going to be using, so I have to be careful to make sure they're not too dark. So I'm gonna start with the shadow before I do the background. And I'm mixing up a purple, a um, blue-gray, and a bit of Payne's gray. And I'm also going to mix up a little bit of a shadow that can be used on skin. And I did a little bit of that in Copic first, but I wanna do it again with the watercolor. Now I mentioned the other night um, that if you have kind of a limited selection of Copics, but you have access to watercolors or you have your own watercolors, this is a great technique to use because it's really going to to make it seem like you have access to a larger library of color than you actually do. And the great thing about watercolor is that you really need very few colors to mix what you need. I think most people who have Copic markers have, or alcohol-based markers, have a collection of at least 50. Um, whereas you actually don't even need that many watercolors to be able to mix an infinite variety of hues. Um, I'm gonna, I can quickly count these and get back to you guys with how many I keep in my standard palette. But uh, I'd hazard a guess that it's under 50, though it's probably closer to 50 than it is under. Now I'm doing this whole thing on Canson's artboard and um, it has the Montval watercolor paper finish. 
So this is also kind of like a preliminary review for what I happen to think of that artboard because it's my first time using it. Um, I do use Montval for seven inch Kara pages, so I'm very familiar with it. And um, it does have some limitations. It's not my favorite watercolor paper, but it is my favorite color watercolor paper for comics, if that makes sense. And it's kind of a student grade or an ac academic grade watercolor paper. Now I forgot to grab some paper towels. So as soon as I get a little bit of a break, I'm going to go do that. Another nice thing about watercolors is um, you can add additional pigment to your water or you can work straight from your palette or you can uh, dilute mixtures you have which gives you a much wider range of color than you would have with markers. So I have this first layer down on the Mont Ball. Now it isn't over here, let me see if I can zoom in and get the reflection because I don't want to lift it. It isn't soaking into the paper, the artboard, as quickly as it normally would. It's just sort of sitting on the surface. And working with alcohol markers, that can be um, a side effect of using marker on your paper first, or it might be an issue with the board that they attach the Montval paper surface to. So I'm going to let that dry and I'll get back to you guys when I grab some paper towels and counted how many watercolors I'm using. So I counted 45 half pans in my watercolor palette and um, a lot of them are convenience colors. They're duplicates that I have, um, not because I need them, but because it's easier than mixing them fresh every time. So really I could get away with a far smaller palette I just like having those colors ready mixed. Um, and watercolor half pans, depending on where you buy them, they can be anywhere from $7 to $10. And that might seem kind of pricey, but you need to keep in mind that A, you don't need as many as you would alcohol-based markers in order to get the same range of color. Two, they actually last a lot longer than most alcohol-based markers were. So you're really getting your money's worth. Three, if you save your half pans or if you can find half pans sold in stores, my local Jerry sells them, you can buy tubes and um, you can actually, for, for a $10 tube, you can refill your palette several times. So really watercolors, especially good watercolors, are very economical, more so than alcohol-based markers. Of course, a lot of people say they... Um, you know, they have trouble learning how to do watercolor. Um, the techniques in terms of um, how you think about color, it's very similar to alcohol markers. But in terms of how quickly you can paint, they're very different. I usually paint with, um, I usually paint like two paintings at a time because I'm impatient and I've found that uh, having a couple of things going, at, when one is done, I can start working on the next. So um, if you're interested in watercolor and you find that you're not patient enough, why don't you just try working on two paintings with the same color palette at the same time? So I applied another layer of shading on the skin and that's going to be the last layer of shading I apply on the skin. Um, it seems to have soaked in so I can move on now to the shadow color I mixed and this is just kind of like a general purpose shadow color um, and if I need to I can mix it darker but I want to start with it fairly light because it needs to work for a variety of of colors of things I'm rendering so like I'm rendering her the trim on her dress now but I'm also rendering the blue of her dress and I'll probably mix my shadow color a little darker to compensate for that. And I can even apply it on areas in the skin and hair. And that's another thing that's good about using your watercolors over your Copic markers is you don't need, when you work with them together, you don't need to be nearly as careful as you would if you're doing just one alone. 
for those of you who are um, new to my channel and you're curious about how I use Copic markers, how I render with them, um, I highly recommend you check some of the videos that I'm, I'm going to attach cards to them here. So, um, you know, after you watch this, why don't you check those out? And see, the watercolor doesn't reactivate my Copic because they use two different solvents. Alcohol markers use alcohol as the solvent for their inks and dyes, and watercolor uses water as the solvent solvent for your pigments. Uh, water and maybe a little bit of glycerin or some honey. It really depends on um, what brand you're using as to what sort of binder that brand is going to use. But in general, they don't really activate one another. And I find it's easiest to go from alcohol-based markers to watercolor, just so I don't contaminate my Copic nibs or my water-based, alcohol-based markers, sorry, nibs with um, the pigments. Of course, I can also treat Oh, hmm. I can also treat watercolors like watercolors and lay, layer them on top of each other for darker tones like I did here on Kara's neck. And of course, this technique isn't suitable for all of your marker applications. Um, it really depends on what paper you're using and how well your paper can handle the water application as well as how heavy handed you are. I'm actually having difficulty getting my watercolors to blend and pick up the way they normally would. And um, using alcohol markers can affect that slightly, but I also think um, the artboard itself might be part of the issue. And using uh, alcohol markers and um, watercolors as a mixed media also uh, you can produce a similar effect in a shorter amount of time because you're not spending all your time on the watercolor. You're working at first with a very immediate medium, alcohol-based markers, and then you're just adding details and shadows with the watercolor. Now see her face, the doll's face over there, it looks kind of splotchy and uh, dark. So I'm going to try and use some water to blend it out. And unfortunately, I'm not too successful. Um, I guess because the alcohol markers kind of change the paper surface. That's fine. It's not really that big of a deal. So I need to let this dry and I'm going to mix my shadow color a little bit darker and then I'll get back to you guys. All right. So that is pretty much dried. Now I can go in with a slightly darker mix of my shadow color. And um, for those of you who have purchased like the 24 packs of Copics, this is a really useful technique for you because um, it means you can start using that pack right away. Even, <laughs> I mean, I know some of you have complained, and it's been my complaint as well, that those packs don't um, include enough uh, colors that complement each other well, that will blend each other with each other. Um, they don't really include enough of those colors to be able to, for an artist to be able to get to work with them right away. Uh, you're missing like skin colors and good colors for hair and just good general light blending colors. Well, if you start mixing watercolor into your mix, um, it's really going to open that up for you. because you won't be reliant on finding enough uh, light, mid-range, and dark colors in order to get smooth blends. You can, uh, you can use the Copic markers or any alcohol markers to just put down like your most saturated tones or your most important colors. So like the blue of the dress, for example, and then add the rest in with watercolor. Unfortunately, the brush I'm using is really pretty garbage uh, and it wants to like just bend all over the place like a wet noodle. All 
All right, so once this layer dries, I can go in and show you guys um, a magic trick, kind of, that involves a clear wax crayon and some watercolor. So I'll be back when this dries. All right, so while I was waiting for some of the shadow to dry, I mixed up a darker shadow and I went ahead and applied it because the shadow I put down wasn't as dark as I would have liked. Um, so now, um, it, none of it is actually touching the area I'm going to be applying the wash to. So I think I can go ahead and move forward. Now I'm gonna show you guys a little bit of magic. Yesterday I applied a white, or not even a white, it was a clear wax crayon to the background of this and I drew a design. And that wax, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with um, wet media techniques, that wax forms a resist against the water I'm applying. So it's like a magic background <laughs> appears. Maybe I'm kind of a dork because I think that's kind of cool. Because it's like you go from, it looks like nothing to, oh, there's the background magic and I'm using uh, a very light yellow orange um, and this is actually a Soho color and Soho watercolors are hit or miss I've seen a lot of people complain about them online and about how they're chalky um, so if I recommend a particular color to you you should know that a I hate chalky watercolors so I would never recommend a chalky color to you guys and B I use it myself regularly it's in my palette so you are you know my recommendation is backed with actual repeated use not just yeah I get a kit back because I don't So that's the first layer of the background. And you can see I've already got some pooling. The areas where the color is more intense, it's uh, pooled. And I could let it dry like that, or I can try to spread it out more to get a little more even coverage. I can also kind of wick it away using my brush and dab that on a paper towel. Or if I'm very careful, I can lightly dab the paper towel into it, but that's going to create areas where it's completely lifted. So really the most foolproof method for wicking away excess water is to just, you know, run your clean brush across the area and then dab it on a clean paper towel. So I've got a pretty even coverage. I'm going to allow all of this to dry and then I will apply another layer. All right, so that first layer of orange is pretty much dried. And I've noticed that the artboard is taking a little longer to dry than um, other, than most other watercolor papers I've used. So that is kind of a, a negative mark against it. However, I did not have to tape the surface. I didn't have to stretch the surface. So if you hate uh, taping your watercolor paper down, if you hate stretching your watercolor paper, and you don't mind a slightly longer dry time, and you don't mind um, the sacrifice that comes from using um, a watercolor paper that isn't quite as nice as you might be used to because I'm pretty sure Montval is like cellulose based rather than rag, like cotton rag and cotton rag papers are the ones you really want to use because um, they're really nice and you can get a lot of blending and mixing techniques that you can't otherwise get um, on the cheaper student grade papers. I mean, student grade is fine to learn, it's fine to practice on, but don't feel too bad if, when you're trying to do more advanced techniques, if you're having trouble accomplishing them on those student papers. So I also brought out something I think is kind of special. Um, and I'm gonna be doing tutorials on this specifically a little bit later but I wanted to introduce it to this background 
and that is some orange brusho that I have put in a salt cellar with a little bit of rice just to absorb excess moisture. And uh, even though it shouldn't be a problem because Kara skin should be mostly, if not entirely dry, I did want to wait until her skin was dry before I started applying this because I don't want orange like on her skin or on her dress. So I'm going to let this layer dry and uh, then I'll check back in with you guys. Actually, I really want to make sure it doesn't just like form around her. So I'm going to add some close to her hair and her dress. And when you're using brush out, you need to be really careful because the stuff gets everywhere. It doesn't seem to matter how careful I am. It gets everywhere. And every time I use brush out, I end up sneezing blue and orange for a week. So um, just keep that in mind if you're interested in brush out. So like I said, I'm going to let this dry and then I'll check back in with you guys. That layer is mostly dry. It's dry to the touch. Oh, no, I found one area that wants to be really stubborn. Um, but as you can see, the brush out dispersed somewhat, but not entirely. Now you can use a water bottle to help with that or, uh, well, that sample example is not dry either. <laughs> um, I want to darken the bottom a little bit. And I'm curious if Brusho um, will completely reactivate. So bear with me. Because some areas are not as dark as I would have liked. And it looks like, for the most part, if you're not scrubbing too hard, the brush -o stays in place um, once you put it down. It's not going to shift a whole lot. So you could layer on top of the brush -o if you want to. Let me do the same for the other side. Now, of course, if you, you do get movement, like I'm getting movement over here, and you don't want that, you can always go over it with more brush out to keep that sort of um like a uh, chaotic burst effect going of course this background does not do anything to make her look less crazy in this particular image I dare say it makes her look even more crazy that's okay i wanted to play with the paper and i wanted an excuse to use brush out in um an illustration and you know I mean it's fine and for those of you who are curious I just used orange I mean uh, brush oil really only comes with one orange it would have been nice if they came with a couple of different oranges because you can have different intensities but some of the yellows are more orange than yellow so kind of works out anyway so um, I did get at uh, after it soaked into the paper, it did seem to uh, blend out the brush out that I put down over there. So I do kind of want to reapply, but it's pulled so much that it's probably just going to swirl and not really give a starburst effect. So what I can do is I can put a little bit of brush out now, and then when it's dry, I can put more brush out and spray it with water very carefully. So I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to put a little bit now and I'll come back to it in a little while and spritz it with some clean water. So I'm going to let this dry and I'll get back with you guys. So my paper isn't entirely dry. There's still quite a few wet areas, but I also wanted to get some of the brush better mixed in. So I'm just going to go in with a little clean water and try to carefully spritz and you can see um, those of you who are familiar with brush -o, the effect I have on this paper here let me in fact grab an example I 
the effect that I have on the paper here isn't really the effect I was necessarily going for. I was more going for this sort of um, dispersed splattering where you can see all the individual colors. And I think the reason it didn't work out that way is because I applied the brush -o on top of um, wet paper. So I think what I'm going to do in order to achieve the effect I want is I'm going to allow this to dry, hence why I'm actually activating the brush -o that's on the paper now, because um, I want it to mix in. And then I'm going to apply a layer of brush -o and then spritz it and see if I can't get it closer to what I want. Now, as long as I am patient and I allow things to dry um, and I'm careful, I shouldn't have too much of a problem with the inks bleed bleeding into Kara here. Um, if I really wanted to, I could cover her in the wax crayon and that would form an, a resist, or I could cover her with masking fluid um, I really don't want to do that. I'm just going to be as careful as possible to prevent con cross contamination of color. So I'm going to let this dry and I'll get back to you guys. All right, so my watercolor has, oh no, there's a spot, two spots, two stubborn spots, but I'm gonna proceed anyway. So as we discussed, I am going to, there it is. I am going to sprinkle my illustration with some brush -o, and then I'm going to spray it with water. And since I am not masking Kara, I need to be very careful with how I sprinkle and how I spray. And one of the ways I can do that is um, I can spray from around Kara, like from the outside, inside going out rather than uh, just kind of spraying whichever which way. So I have liberally sprinkled brush -o along my work all over my uh, paper surface. And I'll regret this later because there's going to be brush -o everywhere. And now I'm spraying from the outside. And I still need to be careful because even though I'm spraying from the outside, Kara still gets a bit wet. And so if you get some, some like, yeah, let me clean it up and then I'll talk. If you get some spray in an area where you don't want that color affected, you need to be quick about it and use um, your paper towel to pick up what you can before it stains. Now, Montval um, doesn't hold a barrier as well as um, other nicer watercolor papers. It all tends to soak in eventually. So you might be fighting a losing battle. It might be where you need to apply um, some white or some color pencil. But even careful spraying will result in brush -o where you don't want it. So with the orange, I'm still not getting the sort of effect I was hoping for like this. Um, I don't know if it's the paper or I'm spraying too close. I mean, I could be oversaturating the area. Uh, it is definitely more crazy person orange now than it was. So I think I need to just call it a night, let it dry and quit it with the brush out. So um, the last thing I need to show you guys is adding white accents to this. And that can be done in a variety of ways. So go ahead and pull out your color pencils, your watercolor pencils, your white wash and your Copic opaque white. Um, and I will be ready to get that going when this dries. So I'll see you guys in a bit. My background is pretty much dry to the test and something I wanna do is um, if it is completely dry, oh no, see? See where the light hits it? Nope. All right, so I gotta wait. For, <laughs> I gotta wait for that to dry before I can show you guys the next step. My apologies. I think it is officially dry for real now. And since it is, I just want to brush off the excess brush-o. 
And again, you have to be careful with brush o because it will go everywhere and you'll be finding it. Like a week later, you'll put down your glass and there'll be like a ring of green or a ring of orange, depending on what you put down. Now, even though I was really careful, these areas absorb the yellow from the, let me show you guys. These areas absorb the orange from the brush that was applied. Um, and I was trying to be careful, but I didn't want to mask it off. Um, so that is both a user error, I knew that was a possibility, but also a problem with the paper itself. Um, the fibers, the cellulose fibers wicked it into the area pretty substantially too, as you can see. And I'd left those areas pretty dry and I kept trying to absorb um, the water in the brush out with a paper towel and that just really wasn't good enough. So um, if you are interested in using Canton's uh, Montval artboard, that is something to keep in mind. And I am getting a little bit of warping, although not nearly as much warping as I would get from paper that hadn't been tacked down. So it's still pretty sturdy. Now it's time to add um, highlights. I'm sorry, I'm looking around to see if I have a piece of tracing paper actually might have something better. I don't want to rest my hand directly on the brush o because it's very staining. So here's just like a piece of scrap plastic from my um, art bin that I'm not going to use that can serve as sort of um, a protective barrier between me and my paper. And I'm fishing for a... Well, I want that one, yes. But I also want... this because I want to go back in a couple of areas and add a little additional shadow before I move too far along. So that needs to dry before I can put white on top of it. But that's not a big deal because I want to put white up here first. So I have several tools with which I can apply white. And I've talked to you guys about this a lot, many, many times. I have the white blender from Windsor & Newton. Now this is ethanol based, so it won't really reactivate my alcohol markers and it won't really reactivate my watercolor. Um, and I can put down sort of um, like layers of opaque white and build up opacity. I have a white signo pin. Now this is gonna put down a very opaque line, but it's a very fine line. I have a white color soft, which is a color pencil, a very soft pigmented color pencil. And then I have a white pen from Recollections. And it's actually one of my favorite opaque white pins. It's not for fine details, but it can. it is like the big version of the signo. Now, none of these are water-based, or I'm sorry, actually, I don't know that any of them are even water-based. I also have opaque white, which is applied with a brush using a little bit of water. And um, you can also use a white color pencil, especially if you wanna blend out your white application. Now, I'm not going to be able to go into these areas where the brush is on top of the, the wax. I'm not gonna be able to go over that with any of these because that's got a resist to it. Um, the wax is going to resist me doing that. But if I really wanted to, I could wet the area and dab it off and it should come up. I'm not making any promises though because you know I don't actually know if it will come up, but it ought to come up. So, um, why don't we get started? Aha, so if this picks up brush out, it's gonna run with it. So you wanna be careful that it does not pick up any stray grains of brush out. And if it does, you wanna clean off your marker. In fact, it looks like it is picking up the brush out anyway. So um, note that pigment marker and brush out apparently uh, intermingle 
which is not good if you're trying to do corrections or add white. I will admit I'm not all that concerned about it right now. Now, if you wanted to add some highlights to say that orange area on the doll's dress, or if you wanted to add a design, you could use the Color Soft Color Pencils once it's dry to sort of add a highlight in. And if any of your areas got a little too desaturated, you can also bump up your saturation again with some color pencil. So if you're an artist or um, an illustrator or you're interested in becoming an artist, your studio, especially for this kind of art, your studio really benefits from having good color pencils, um, a handful of alcohol markers and some watercolors. Everything else, you can add that as your collection, as you earn money, as your collection grows. But these three play really nicely together. Primarily do traditional work. I do do some digital art sometimes, but the majority of my work is traditional. So if you ask my opinion of how I got to where I am, how I became the artist I am, I'm going to tell you, you need to invest your money in traditional supplies. Um, and good traditional supplies if you can. That's a Derwent Intense watercolor pencil. And the nice thing about this is it can be blended out so the transition isn't particularly harsh. Of course, if there's brush -o afoot, it is going to reactivate the brush -o and there's gonna be orange in there. So it's gonna be like a terrible surprise if there is brush -o in there. because even a little grain of brush -o is going to really affect what you're doing. So maybe, maybe in the future, the next time we do this sort of project, we should do the brush -o at the very, very end. But even though I'm demonstrating it to you guys, I'm still kind of learning how to use it too. So we're learning this together. Little bit of white applied on top of areas of brush that you don't want can make it also look, uh, it can just kind of negate the application a little bit. And I mean, you don't want to be obvious about it. You don't want to like scribble it on, but it'll make it less noticeable. So at least one good white color pencil is definitely handy to have in your studio. And with the Derwent Color Soft, not Color Soft, I'm sorry, Derwent Ink Tents, you can find those uh, open stock at a lot of art supply stores. You can also purchase them in sets. I find open stock to be the most useful way for me to purchase these. So that's what I recommend. Sets tend to be geared toward giving you a lot of colors and a variety of colors, but not necessarily colors that um, work well together or that you can easily use. Now I need to wait until her hair bobbles are a little more dry before I can put any sort of anything on top of them. Now I really, her eyes look kind of crazy. And um, when I posted this on Instagram, that was like the two comments I got is that you can't not do the shines on the eyes and I, I wasn't skipping them. I just wanted to try doing them later in the, the piece. She definitely does look crazy. I agree with you there. Um, so let's use this opaque white from Recollections to start putting in a shine. Now apparently this is water-based because it's picking up what I put down so I'm gonna have to layer it and I'm gonna have to clean it. And you can clean it if you have, um, I like to use Viva paper towels because they don't have a texture to them. So if you keep stuff like that around the house, Viva paper towels are perfect. You can also clean them off on a piece of cardstock or uh, scrap watercolor paper. 
just something with enough texture to kind of scrub it off for you. Uh, now I need to let that dry before I can apply another layer. And uh, if you hear me furiously blowing, um, it's because I'm trying to make sure there's no brush-o trap somewhere. Brush-o is gonna end up being the bane of my existence just because it gets everywhere. And that needs to dry a little more and then I can apply another layer. Just looking at least a little bit less crazy though. And we can apply another layer of the opaque white. And these are pretty cheap too. They're like a couple bucks. And considering how useful it is to me, I think it's worth it, so. Of course, a Signo is perfect for intense white highlights. So, um, you know, in the eyes, that's fine. Or on the hair or on glass would all be good places for that. And I've heard people say that um, you can use Copic or any alcohol-based markers, colorless blender, to um, sort of blend out your signal to get kind of like a fine point. I have not been so fortunate, so I can't speak to that. It doesn't work for me. Now it's a little bit dry, so I can put in those white reflections on her glass beads in her hair using a Derwent color saw. I can go over where I did the white color pencil. And, well, I'd use, actually, I'd use marker on that. So I can't just paint that back in now that it's gone. I would have to kind of carefully match it. Um, but I think I think I can squeak away with uh, ultramarine blue, which actually had mixed on the side from another project, just to sort of influence the color that I'd put down. And that might not work. It might just be like brush -o nightmare again. But it might work. And the only way you find out is by taking risks. And sometimes you're like, that looks like garbage and I hate it. But you learn something, hopefully. And, uh, you know, you can use that in the next piece to not make the same mistake. Just trying to, like, soften the transition between the opaque white marker and the Signo. She kind of looks like she just set everything on fire. So happy that she set everything on fire. At least that's what it looks like to me. Now, last but not least at all, we have um, the Copic Opaque White. And um, it also comes in a little bottle. Oh, it's not even on camera. Go big, go pick white. It comes in a bottle like this. I hate this bottle. I hate, I hate this stupid brush that doesn't work. It's not a brush. Um, so. In my, if you're asking for my recommendation, I like Copic Opaque White. Some people find it easier to use than white gouache. Um, I think it might be a little cheaper in the long run. Um, I like the jar like this, and I like to use a synthetic brush like that. I don't care for the the other, the one that comes with a brush. I thought that would have been a good idea. I was excited when they released it, and then I regretted buying it because it did not work the way I wanted it to. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my opaque white. It's just a little goopy tonight. Now, if you think yours is goopy, you can add some water. You can mix it on like a palette. Usually I would uh, test it on a piece of paper. It's really good for correcting stray marks, but 
The problem with it is once you've put it down, that's it's going to be a resist for any color you might put on top of it. So just keep that in mind when you're using it. Color pencils can also be a great tool in pushing color and making corrections. So some of my shadow color kind of overstepped its bound, bounds and uh, entered where the orange thread would be. So I can use, or I could use, and I did use a yellow or an orange color pencil to sort of push that back and put the color back where I need it to be. And um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was young and a little, a little foolish, a little naive, I used to think that the artists I admired, especially the artists who did like traditional work or mixed media work, um, they, they didn't make corrections. They didn't have to like go back and forth with different media to get the effect they want. I don't know why. I thought that, um, I think some of them, this was back when DeviantArt was super popular. I think some of them probably, uh, kind of fibbed a little bit about their work time on when they were posting how long it took them. And I mean, if you are not comfortable sharing how long it takes you to do a piece, you don't have to do that, but to, um, intentionally when it comes to the numbers, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Honestly, all that matters is how it looks when you're finished. But if you're going to lie about how long it took you, you're hurting other artists. You're hurting young artists who are looking up to you. So, I mean, I try to be honest about how long it takes me to complete a piece because in the end, it doesn't actually matter if it takes me, you know, two hours or four hours. You know, on a rainy day, it's going to take me longer to watercolor than on a dry day because it's wet outside and there's nowhere for that water to go. And that doesn't have anything at all to do with my skill as an illustrator or how familiar I am with the material. It has everything to do with the fact that it's raining outside. So, um, don't, don't feel bad if it takes you longer than you think it's taking other artists and don't lie about how long it takes you. And I also know some artists who, um, they like, they don't care if they're like a role model to other artists. And you know, it's, it's all well and good to feel that way. Like I certainly wouldn't want some of my behaviors in the past to be used as justification for someone else to behave poorly as well. Um, I have to atone for my own mistakes, but I also recognize that the things that I do and the things that I say are obser observed by others. And, um, it might be perceived by someone who doesn't know better as like, well, that's how, that's how you behave. That's how you do such and such, you know? So like, even if we choose, even if we're, we say we don't want to be used as role models, we are often still role models. So, you know, just be honest when you can be kind and be fair when you can. I think, I think what they meant is they didn't want to be punished if they weren't always perfect. And that's an entirely, that's an entirely different thing. And they shouldn't be punished. Um, but they do need to acknowledge that some younger people are going to see the things that they do and may decide to do the same thing because they admire and they respect them. And that comes from having a public job that comes from having a job that requires people to like you to some extent extent for you to make money for you to make sales they like you so they're gonna buy your stuff you know they want to support you you know it's natural that they're going to try to emulate a little bit and i am an older sister uh i have a brother who's five years younger than me Wow, I had to think about it. I used to, used to just come off the tip of my tongue so easily. Um, he's five years younger than me, and all my life, uh, I had my parents throw in my face, you're not a very good example, you're not being an example, right? Anybody who's an older sibling has parents who've done this to them, right? Um, you're supposed to be an example for your brother to follow, and I really resented it when I was younger because I felt like it was like this impossible standard 
that they expected me to live up to, but it makes a lot of sense to me now because he really did copy like everything. <laughs> I did, and if I got interested in something at when we were young, he would get into it. So, um, you know, even if you don't want to be a role model, you are a role model to somebody. And if someone other than your teacher or your mentor says you're taking too long to do blah, 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 um, ignore them. You're still learning and it doesn't matter. All right, so it is now time to remove the masking tape. And the masking tape is probably not going to want to come off because it's been on for a few weeks. So it might tear and it might not. We'll see. Um, when you are, in fact, it really wants to stick right now. Uh, if When you are removing masking tape, if you want to minimize, oh yeah, the amount of ripping you get, you should remove your masking tape at like a 45 degree angle away from your piece. You will still get paper abrasion and you can't see that, but it, it'll be there. It won't enter into your live area. So I'm going to remove all the tape and then I'll show you guys the finished piece. Okay, so that is how it looks with the borders removed. And, um... There's a little bit of bending, but I mean, the board did a pretty good job considering how much I put it through, really. We did markers, we did watercolor, and we did a lot of brush out. Um, but I'm still not excited about, it's not that I'm not excited about artboard. Artboard did okay. It was the Montball surface I'm less than excited about. Um, when I do standalone illustrations, I don't grab Montball. I grab Arches or um, Fabriano. So I would love to see a higher quality watercolor paper on their artboard. And they might have it out and I might just not know about it. So that was kind of a multi, multimedia, multi purpose video. It was a tutorial, so I hope you guys enjoyed watching me use alcohol markers with watercolor. I hope it was useful to you. I hope it was helpful. I hope it inspired you. I hope you guys enjoyed my little magic trick using um, a clear wax crayon to create a wax resist, a very simple wax resist background. I hope you guys enjoyed watching me play around with brusho and kind of learn on the job. Um, it created a very interesting background that I would not have been able to replicate with um, watercolors, not non brusho watercolors. There. Uh, that's a little bit better. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed seeing me pull out my opaque white kit and use the various um, opaque white media. Um, and I hope you guys learned something, although I don't know quite what, about Canson's art board. Now, all of these materials were paid for out of my pocket, um, for most of them for the purposes of review. Uh, if you enjoy these sort of videos, if you enjoy my channel in general, if you enjoy learning from me and you enjoy my reviews, one way you could seriously help me out is by checking out my Patreon. And there should be a card for that right about here. Um, if you can't afford to back my Patreon, that's okay. Patreon allows you to watch uh, pages you're interested in until you have the money or are willing to commit to that page. So even if you can't afford to um, join the Natastube community this month, maybe next month, maybe in three months, maybe never, that's okay. I would just like you to consider it. Your, uh, your, I don't want to call them donations because I work dang hard for that money. Um, your pledges, your pledges help me purchase materials for review. Um, they help me pay myself back for the time spent creating these videos for you guys. Um, they go towards reimbursing my editor, my video editor who helps me out with this. He doesn't have to, he volunteers his time. It takes up a lot of his time actually. Um, he's fantastic, we should give him a round of applause. But it goes towards reimbursing him. Um, it also goes towards um, helping repay some of the money 
uh, pay, repay some of my time in money that I spend writing at a soup.blogspot.com, which has been going on for six years. Now, as a backer, you guys get all kinds of great stuff. Um, $15 a month total, not from any one individual, but just total unlocks the next month's Sketchbox vs. Art Snacks review. And I know you guys like those because that is where I get the most comments. It's where I get the most hits. And that unlocks it to the public. If you just back in general at $2, you will have access to that regardless if anybody else does. Um, $30 a month unlocks a new bonus uh, alcohol marker tutorial, watercolor tutorial. You can request something. Um, it unlocks that. I will do that for you guys above and beyond my normal schedule. Um, $45 a month unlocks a backer exclusive request live stream. Now what that means is you guys hang out with me in the channel and you guys suggest things you want to see me draw. And I draw them excluding porn and graphic violence. Not going to do those. Other stuff? Yeah. Anthro? Heck yeah, I'll draw your OC. I love drawing Anthro. Super adorable chibi stuff? Yeah, that's my jam. Uh, mech? Yes, I love mech. You guys might not see me draw mech much, but I love drawing mechs. Uh, they usually sell immediately when I bring them to cons, which is why I don't have examples of them floating around. Um, now, you're probably thinking, what about me as an individual? Well, you get goodies too. Um, if you back at $2, whatever is unlocked for that month, you have access to, regardless of what other people have, uh, have backed. As an individual, if you back at 15, that gets you a five pack of my stickers. Now, I know that doesn't sound necessarily like a whole lot, but this isn't you buying stuff. If you just wanna buy stickers, you need to go check out my shop. The card should be right there. Um, and you buying stuff from my shop helps out too. It's just um, more the true cost of the item. So if you're thinking, well, some of these, the, the physical goodies, they sound kind of high. That's because you're not checking out my shop. That's, if you wanna just buy stuff to buy stuff, that's where you should go or you should buy from me at any of the conventions I'm attending this year. And you can find a list of those on the sidebar on my blog. Um, but, I mean, there are physical goodies. I also send out handwritten postcards. That's one of the upcoming tiers. I want to do a mini sketch tier, like a cheap mini sketch tier for you guys that people can more easily afford. But I also have uh, commission tiers for watercolors, markers, all that kind of good stuff. There are comic downloads. There are, um, like, Photoshop assets downloads like there's a lot of good stuff and I plan on adding a lot more I have so many ideas I just want to hear what you guys want so I can move in that direction um so I talked about my patreon a lot I'm sorry but that's like the number one best way you can help me another way you can help me is by liking this video um when you like this video it changes where my video is ranked by YouTube overall so it means more people are likely to see it so so if you thought this was helpful, if you thought it was interesting, if you learned something, or even if all you learned was you don't want to use these materials, please consider liking the video so other people can find it so they can benefit from it too. Another way you can help me and help yourself is subscribe to my channel. If you like this kind of stuff, then why, why not subscribe? Because I update at least once a month and as the Patreon gets rolling, I know, I know the Patreon again, as the Patreon gets rolling, I want to up, I want to change my my schedule to twice a week um, and I want to hire an assistant to come in and edit the video for me because I, I just don't have time to and my editor can't afford to donate any more of his time to it. So that's like my big goal is, a, is to hire an assistant to help me out around the studio. Um, so that's how you guys can help me. I hope you guys have a great day. I hope I see you soon. Uh, bye.